Welcome to our Sound for Video session. Today is the 26th of November, 2017. Today we're going to talk about two things. Number one, I want to talk a little bit more about some things I learned about the Zoom F4 and F8 limiters, which in the past I've assumed were just purely digital. It's actually a more nuanced answer than that after having talked with some of the folks over at Zoom. And then secondly, uh, I want to talk about checklists for production sound jobs. So the checklist you might go through when you're packing up, getting ready to go do a sound recording job. So first of all, let's talk about limiters. I talked a little bit about limiters. We've talked about them a num number of times in the past. Uh, we also covered them in the production sound course. And what I want to just, I guess I, I'm not going to go over how they work in general terms, but um, <laughs> I will link to a previous session where we showed the difference between analog and digital limiters and how digital limiters have some issues with them. Um, or that is to say, they're not necessarily as useful during recording to capture any modulation where somebody gets suddenly very loud. Um, what can often happen in the digital recording world is that those sounds can clip and distort and they don't sound great. So let's take a look here. So here we have a signal chain and what this represents is how sound is recorded in a digital recording situation. So on the left hand side we have a microphone which first of all captures and technically transduces the sound waves into an electrical signal. So it converts them from sound waves into an electrical signal that's an analog signal. It's a fairly weak signal called a microphone level signal and that is sent into a preamplifier. Preamplifier then amplifies it, that is to say makes it stronger, and brings it up to a line level signal, which is again, a much stronger signal. That's then taken into an analog to digital converter, which then converts it into ones and zeros, which can then be recorded to some sort of recording media like SD cards, hard drive, whatever it might be. So that's the overall idea of a signal chain. Now the question is, is where does a limiter come in here? You can see we have represented here, a digital limiter takes place after the sound has made it through the microphone, through the preamplifier, through the analog to digital converter, and then the limiter kicks in and attempts to attenuate the levels on the sound that has come in to the overall signal chain. The problem is at that point it may be a little too late because what's happened is the signal comes in here. In most cases analog can handle a lot of modulation. It can handle much higher sound pressure levels than a lot of analog to digital converters. So it may be okay here. In a preamplifying stage, it can also, um, it can actually eventually distort, but oftentimes what happens is it saturates before it distorts, and saturation is a slightly different thing. Um, it doesn't sound as bad as digital distortion, um, but nevertheless, that can happen as well. And then the signal is sent from there to be converted to digital. So if you put a limiter up here between the microphone and the preamplifier, Oftentimes that can be more effective because what's happening is that that mic level signal is coming in and then the limiter will say, oh, this is going to be, this is modulating a whole lot. We need to manage this. We need to pull those, those spikes down or those peaks down, transients down. And before we put that through the preamplifier so it doesn't overwhelm the preamplifier and doesn't overwhelm the analog to digital converter. So that is on the sound devices 633 and the Mix Pre series, the limiters are analog limiters and they sit right here between the microphone and the preamplifier. On the Zoom F4 and F8, they actually sit here in the digital domain again. Um, and so I assumed up until now that what that meant was that these were very ineffective limiters. They let distortion through much more easily than an analog limiter would, and they weren't as effective at getting the job done. So that, you know, and what, where that becomes a practical issue is if you're acting as a sound recordist on a film set or during your, doing your own pieces and you're recording the sound. The problem is, is that you may have to do a retake if there is some sort of um, distortion that's captured in the sound. You may have to reset your gain levels and do a retake. So we want to try to avoid that, and that's the whole, the whole purpose of limiters, but digital limiters don't help with that. So what I found out um, in talking with Zoom, and actually this is something that uh, a commenter brought up on one of my videos, but it also was something that I noticed when we did the test, and I'll link to the, the test where we compared the sound devices um, and the Zoom F4 and F8. And what we found was that the Zoom F4 and F8 actually had a lot more headroom than I expected it to. It took a lot to get those preamplifiers, or well, it wasn't the preamplifiers, it get, to get the audio to distort. Um, in the Zoom F4 and F8. And what I mean by a lot is I had to yell as loud as I could. <laughs> uh, 
Um, of course, you can gain up, and if you do that, almost everything will be distorted. But I was trying to mimic a more um, type of thing you would generally find when you're recording for a film or video project, where you thought you had the gain level set correctly, and then suddenly this, the talent get very loud. So in any case, what I found is actually the Zoom F4 and F8 did better than I expected. Still not as good as the sound devices, but it left me kind of scratching my head and thinking, well, what's going on here? And I had just assumed that the dynamic range in the Zoom F4 and F8 preamplifiers was just so great that it was able to handle that under most circumstances, except for the super extreme circumstances. Um, I contacted Zoom and asked them this question, and Samuel Green was kind enough to answer for me what he said. He's one of their employees. Um, what he said is that the limiters that are implemented on the F4 and the F8 are actually hybrid limiters. Uh, that's what he called them. What he means by that is the way they work is that on the F4 and F8, when you turn those limiters on, um, and presumably you've already set your gain level to, say, for example, with a condenser mic, you set your gain level to 50 dB of gain. Um, what technically is happening when you turn those digital limiters on in the Zoom F4 and F8, it's actually going back to the preamplifier, the analog preamplifier, and decreasing the gain by 10 dB. So if you set it to 50, it's actually, without telling you, <laughs> it's actually decreasing it to 40 decibels of gain. And then what it does is once the audio signal gets through the analog to digital converter, it actually adds 10 more decibels of gain, except for when the limiter engages, which is a pretty clever way to do it. Um, is it perfect? No, we were still able to get those to clip. It's harder to get the Mix Pre or the Sound Devices 600 series mixers to clip um, or any other analog limiter that's well implemented. But um, that's that's why I was seeing, and that's why I think most people were experiencing more headroom than we expected and less audio was clipping. So that's really great news. I think it's a really clever thing that Zoom has done. Is it the same as an analog limiter? No. Is it a pretty good way to do things? Based on the quality of the preamplifiers in the F4 and F8 and their low, their low nose characteristics, I think that's a pretty interesting and clever way to do that. And it does give you some additional headroom. So I would say turn those limiters on, get them, get them, uh, get them, <laughs> put them in use. And um, I think you'll find that they do a pretty nice job. So there are some thoughts on the Zoom F4, F8 limiters. If you have questions, go ahead and leave those down below. Let's move on to our next topic here, which is actually something we've covered before, but I wanted to cover again. And that is a checklist for packing your sound recording kit before you go and do a job. Um, I'll make this available. I'll leave a link for this down below the video. Um, I've been using this now for a couple of years, and some of you actually contributed some ideas to this, so I really appreciate that. Um, go ahead and use this, modify it to fit your particular circumstances, but let me just kind of run through some of the things that I've got on here and, and kind of talk about why I put them on here. Up here at the top, we've got our sound bag, obviously. In most cases, when I am doing a job for other people, I'm usually operating from a bag. That is to say it's on location, we're moving around quite a bit, and having the mixer recorder in the bag is necessary. So um, I use the Orca bags. I've got a couple of them. I've got the OR34, which is a very large bag, which I don't use that one quite as much. And then I've also got an OR30, which fits the Sound Devices 633. It fits my Mix Pre 10T um, and my Zoom F4 and F8. So um, that's what I do there. That that Those bags also I try to keep as light as possible. I'm not trying to stuff everything into it. I may put more stuff into it when I get to the location. I take a bunch of that stuff out that I don't want to be carrying around all day because you've got to keep your energy levels up and you don't want to be carrying around a whole lot more weight than you have to. So that's a thought there. I also use the Orca harness, which is like a vest harness. Um, it is incredibly comfortable and it works beautifully with the Orca bags. Um, it also has a battery pack on the back that you then runs a USB port up to the front on one shoulder, which is a clever um, thing. Um, it has a mesh material on it that makes it very breathable. So it's not like you're just, I mean, you'll still sweat if you <laughs> are, are working hard, but it, it dries out pretty nicely. So it's a pretty nice, um, it's a nice setup. Of course, I need to bring my field mixer recorder. This is my primary recorder. In most cases for me, that's going to be my sound device is 633. The 633 is interesting from the standpoint of the different ways it can be powered. It can be powered via AA batteries, but just for a very short time. It uses so much power that um, it doesn't, doesn't go for a long time on AA's. It does have a spot for six AA batteries, so I keep those in there, and those are really just meant to carry me over while I'm doing the switch out of other batteries. 
So I want to bring six of those and I want to have them charged up the night before. I bring the primary batteries. These are Sony NPF style batteries, Sony L batteries, if you will. And usually I bring three of those at the the mixer can hold two, and then I have a third one in spare. That will usually get me through an entire day. I've actually never had a case where it didn't get me through an entire day. In fact, usually just two of them will get me through an entire production day. All right, I also bring a backup field mixer or recorder in every case as well. And that's going to depend on the job, which one I bring. Um, in the past, I brought my Mix Pre or my Zoom F4 or Zoom F8. Um, my, my most recent one, I actually brought the 633 as my primary mixer and the Sound Devices Mix Pre 10T as the backup. And I've never had to pull a backup out yet, but I'm sure the day will come. So having that plus all the batteries that you need to power that is necessary as well. So um, I actually need to add a line here. And let me just do that really quickly here. And in this case, with my, my Sound Devices Mix Pre 10T, those are going to be Sony NPF style batteries as well. So I'm generally going to want three of those. Okay, I also bring a backup battery, um, a big battery. This is an Anton Bauer or gold mount battery. Um, I usually bring the 90 watt hour. That can easily power me through an entire day. Um, it's just an extra level of assurance. That's the one I don't generally carry with me. I will usually leave that one in the car, but it's nice to have it there in case things really go haywire. <laughs> and I've actually also been able to lend it out in some cases for productions. People needed to, uh, the director wanted to pull out an extra light and we didn't have power for it. Um, sometimes there've been a couple cases where we've used that as well. Of course, there's a cable. I need to, there's a cable, a DTAP uh, cable for the Anton Bauer battery. So the Anton Bauer battery has a DTAP output, and then I have a cable that converts that to high res to get it into the Mix Pre 10T or the Sound Devices 633. Next up, ComTech kit. This is the uh, kit that you can use so that the director or script supervisor or perhaps a client or a producer can put on and hear what we're actually recording. So I have a kit that includes one transmitter and two receivers, two sets of headphones. The ComTech is powered by a nine volt battery. So I usually bring three of those, one for the transmitter, one for the, well, I should say they're already loaded with nine volt batteries, but in case I need to switch them out, I bring three additional nine volt batteries. So I just need to make sure I've got some of those purchased. I don't have any rechargeables of those yet. I need to probably look into that. Of course, XLR cables. I usually bring, for most of my jobs, I usually am only booming a single mic. So I usually bring three cables again, probably just leave two of them in the car, but bring my primary cable with me. Again, that's just in case things go bad. Um, I have had one cable go bad over the years and it was good to have a backup. So always definitely a good idea. Um, next up, I bring my cardioid boom microphone. So that's going to differ depending on the job. And in fact, on this most recent job that I did earlier this week or last week, um, I brought a couple of bikes. I brought my Sheps uh, CMC MK41, which is the super cardioid mic, which I typically use indoors. I also brought my Sennheiser 8050, which is a super cardioid boom mic as well. Um, we ended up using the Sennheiser. It just seemed to work pretty well with the main talent's voice. And uh, so that's what we did. Um, but it's good to have a backup there if you can as well. You have to kind of kind of weigh out and balance how much backup you bring because you could end up filling an entire truck <laughs> with backup stuff. Um, generally, sound kits are relatively small relative to camera and lighting kits. So um, I don't usually have too many qualms about bringing extra stuff, especially if I'm, if I'm driving to the location myself, which is generally the case for my jobs. Of course, I bring a shotgun microphone as well. In this case, I had my DPA 4017B, and that's what we use the majority of the day outdoors. Um, we did have a couple of spots where we went inside of an abandoned house on this most recent shoot. Um, this was a, <laughs> it's a kind of a funny piece. It's a, it's a tongue in cheek kind of zombie apocalypse, um, commercial. And, uh, we'll put, we'll probably talk more about it later on. Um, but we did shoot indoors in an abandoned house. And in that case, I thought, well, let's use the boom mic. Um, what I found was. That was a good idea because it, the, the indoors were very reverberant and I didn't want to run into phase issues, which, which you can with shotgun microphones sometimes. And um, But I did find that there was, because it was an abandoned house, all the windows were knocked out. And so there was still some wind coming in. So we did have to put it inside of a, um, a wind jammer or a blimp type thing. In my case, I used the Cyclone from Rycote. 
lavalier microphones. Um, now this is this is uh, you know wireless kits. I've got three channels of wireless in my own kit. So what I need to do is if I'm called up to do a job, I need to talk to the director beforehand or the producer, whomever is you know whomever I'm communicating with on that job, to kind of sort out exactly what things look like. Ideally, I should have a script, and you'll notice that's down here at the bottom. Ideally, they should provide a script. That does not always happen. Um, but if they do not provide a script, what I like to do is find out exactly how many people we're going to need to mic throughout the day. Generally, again, I'm just using one boom microphone, and then I've got wireless lavs on each of the other actors or talent. In most cases, I can get away with three channels just based on the jobs I do. And in fact, I think a lot of jobs are going to fall into that category unless you start getting into the larger productions. But every once in a while, that can be something different. You can maybe have a panel discussion or something. I don't know. Or one scene where you have a lot of actors that all have lines for whatever reason. In those cases, you may need more channels of wireless. And that's why it's important to communicate with the director up front ahead of schedule so that if there is a case where you do need more channels than you have or own then you can make arrangements to either rent or borrow some from a friend or colleague or whatever it may be. So fortunately, I've never run into that, but I, I do like to get that figured out ahead of time so that there are no surprises on the spot. I did have a circumstance a couple of months ago before I got my Comtep kit, Comtech kit that um, a producer came to me after we had already started shooting and said, hey, I need, I need headphones for the client who's here. And I was not prepared for that. And I didn't know that was a requirement. We That wasn't mentioned ahead of time. I should have known to ask that. Um, so lesson learned there for me. But that's, that's in my standard set of questions. And in fact, I think what we probably should do on a future episode is come back and talk and put together a list of kind of stand, a standard set of questions to ask your clients before you show up, just so that you're prepared and communicate exactly what they're looking for. And you are prepared with all the gear you need to support that. So of course we got the, micro the lavalier microphones, the wireless kits that go along with that, all the batteries for the wireless kits, any adapters you need for the wireless kits. Again, I'm, if I'm bringing them into one of my mixers, I'm usually coming into one of the XLR inputs. And so I need those 3.5 to XLR adapters in most cases. Also like to have a separate uh, lavalier mounting kit. In my case, um, I keep it in this little container here. It's pretty easy to schlep around. Some people have them in smaller containers, but I've got things in here like um, Rycote stickies in different shapes and sizes, undercovers, overcovers. Um, I've got some hush lavs in here to hide lavaliers. I've got transport tape. I've got um, top stick. So a couple of different types of tape. I also have in here, incidentally, just because it, um, oh yeah, I also have moleskin. Um, I also happen to put in here some dry erase markers for slating to mark up the slate board. Um, just because they happen to fit in here nicely, and I usually, you know, I'm taking both of them, so that works for me. I also like to bring a pair of scissors. always have those in my go bag. Not in my sound bag, but in my go bag. Because once you're mounting those uh, lavaliers, sometimes you need those. Fortunately, with the stickers, you don't generally need them, but if you're going to be cutting up moleskin or things of that nature, you do generally need them. Of course, a boom pole. Um... I'm using my K-Tech. I do need to get some sort of sheath or carrying bag for it because it's it's delicate, it's carbon, and uh, I don't want to smash it. <laughs> uh, but that's one of the things I do have on my list. A shock mount. You never want to get to the job site without your shock mount if you are booming. And um, I always boom and sometimes use lavaliers. Uh, I shouldn't say always. Most of the time I'm booming and lavaliers tend to be optional in most of the work I'm doing, but... Uh, in most cases, I'm doing both. Would be bad to show up without a shock mount. Um, I like to bring a sentry stand and a boom holder as well. So if there is an interview, um, I can set that up. And, and you know, especially if it's a two-person interview, um, being able to set up two stands with boom holders, that makes your job a lot easier. Then you're just focused on mixing. So you can get the microphones pretty much boomed exactly where you need them, statically on the sentry stand with the boom holder, and you're good to go. Also like to have gaffer's tape. I don't end up using it a lot myself, but it can be a good problem solver on set. And oftentimes the way it comes in handy is, um, you know, either a gaffer or the director. Again, I'm working on smaller pieces, so usually the director is the gaffer. <laughs> um, but a lot of times they'll ask, you know, has anyone got gaff tape? And so I can usually bring some gaff tape. Sandbags to stabilize the stands, the sentry stands, that's always important. 
Um, a blimp or a windjammer, um, as I mentioned before, I use a cyclone from Rycote, which is like a blimp cover, um, but it's a little easier to get in and out of and to change out microphones. And that one works really well. What I find just for reference is that if you do use that, it's so good at isolating wind noise that if you are in a windy location, you probably should record some wind noise <laughs> so that the mixer has an option to mix that in to make it sound more natural without distorting the microphone. So definitely something to consider there. Of course, you need your headphones for monitoring. I um, Lately, I've been using the Sony MDR7506s, I think they're called. They're they're all ubiquitous. They're all over the place. I think they're $80 or $100 or something like that. Um, and they are, um, they're fine. They're a little bass heavy, but they fold up nicely. And I can usually hear the things that I need to hear to make mixing decisions. So that's good. A slate. And here you don't have to get super ha fancy. You don't have to have a time code slate necessarily. If you do have a time code slate, I hope you're charging more for that because <laughs> that's an expensive piece of gear. And um, yeah. Next up, time code boxes. Um, you know, the funny thing is, is I've got time code and I've used it a few times, but what I find is that there are very few small productions that use it. In, some, um, in fact, the one last week, they were planning to use it. When we got there, they opted not to use it. Um, and that happens a lot. But if you can bring it and it's part of the kit and you're prepared to set it up, that's all the better. It just makes you more valuable to the overall production. Bringing an Apple box is really important because if you are going to be booming all day long, sometimes you're kind of relegated to a corner where you cannot reach the talent very well with your boom pole because of the way the lights are set up or whatever the case may be. Having an Apple box is really helpful because then you you gain another however many inches and you have a better time of, of getting the reach that you need. As I mentioned before, we've got a dry erase pen. I also like to bring a regular pen and a Sharpie just so you can mark things as needed. Backup uh, SD cards or CF cards, depending on what your mixer uses. I always keep several of those in the bag as well. Um, I like to bring a compact flash SD card reader so that if the production allows it, we can actually offload the media right there, you know, at lunchtime and at the end of the shoot or however often we need to. On the last one I did, we ended up doing it right after the shoot, which is nice because then there's not a lot of coordinating you have to do after the fact to deliver the media or, or deliver the files and, and or get your media back. <laughs> These days, fortunately, a lot of the media, the SD cards in particular, are so inexpensive that there have been a few where I've just given it to the director at the end of the day. And yeah, it was a $15 card or something like that, so it wasn't a huge deal. But they always tell me, this uh, <laughs> the person who shall remain nameless has told me multiple times, oh, I need to get that back to you. And they never remember to. And I've, I've written it off at this point. Another thing that's very important is having a clipboard with sound report sheets, at least one of them. Um, I like to bring several because sometimes it, it runs over. If you're operating from a bag, it's hard to, do the, to, to actually keep a sound report. If you're operating from a table or cart, it's a lot easier to do that. And... Um, you just need to have a strategy in mind for what you're going to do. A lot of times I'll just auto-generate reports in, this, in the sound devices, um, the Mix Pre or the sound devices 633. Great to have a script, and you should study the script and know what's coming because that is what it informs you about what gear you need, how many microphones you need, um, planning out what you're going to do for each scene, having contingencies for each scene in, in case something goes wrong. All very good things to do. You should have some business cards with you if you are going to be working on set. You're probably working with some people you haven't worked with before. Giving them a card uh, can help you get your next job. So definitely an important thing to do. I learned from my friend Scott. And then finally, water and snacks. On the smaller productions, there generally is not craft services or the craft services come in the form of they bring some water bottles and um, some snacks. And if you have dietary restrictions or whatever it may be, um, that could pose a problem. In my case, for example, I'm, I have a gluten intolerance. So for me, I like to bring stuff so that if, <laughs> if what they bring is a bunch of big muffins that are full of gluten and wheat, then I still have something to eat to get me through the day. And you've got to keep your energy up. You've got to keep your um, fluid intake going so that you're set to go and you don't end up messing things up or getting foggy minded because you weren't really prepared for the job. So there's some things, again, I'll put a link for that down below. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and leave those down below as well. Get out there and make some great sound. Talk to you again next week.